if you want to plan for the future, we can help your dreams come true. A degree that gets you the right job. It's affordable and easy for you. It's not a community college. Friendly people that know who you are. It's not a community college. A college so close I can take you so far. Hello and welcome to It's Nantuck Changing Lives. I'm your host, Tim St. James, Interim Dean of Students at It's Nantuck Community College. If you've tuned into Changing Lives over the past year, you're likely aware of the fact that there have been many physical changes at the college um, that have been received with a sense of excitement, optimism, and pride. We have a new student-focused tower lobby that boasts of a new cafe, conference center, student space uh, for organizations and clubs to meet, um, a new bookstore, but definitely the epicenter of student engagement, engagement excuse me, on campus. In addition to that, a little over a year ago, we also celebrated the uh, groundbreaking, or excuse me, the ribbon cutting for our brand new Advanced Manufacturing Technology Center, um, which will be helping us to educate the future workforce for manufacturing in the state of Connecticut over the many years to come. But although there have been many physical changes, um, the one thing that has not changed at its Nantuck is the personal attention that we give to our students and, to our, and the commitment to their success. So the two guests that I have with me this evening um, work with students on a daily basis to help them meet not only their education but career goals as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my guests starting immediately to my left. We have Amanda Looney Getz, who is our Academic and Transfer Advisor. and. Kat Carter, who is our academic and career advisor. So for starters, I'd like to just turn it over to you guys, if you don't mind, to tell us a little bit about yourselves and, and how you came to work at Iznantuck and what you like most about what you're doing here. Sure. Um, I guess I'll start. Uh, my name is Amanda Looney Getz, and I am the transfer and academic advisor at Iznantuck. Uh, I've been there for almost three years now. Kat and I actually started on the same day. Um, <laughs> I feel like I have a lot of experience uh, that has really lent to me doing this job very well uh, because I have worked at many campuses across uh, both Connecticut and Illinois uh, and I also myself uh, started at a community college so I'm really passionate about this work because I know that good advising really helps students kind of figure out what they're doing and take it to the next level. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so as Tim said, my name's Kat Carter. I'm the academic and career advisor on campus. When students have any trouble remembering who does career and who does transfer, it's pretty easy with the Kat career alliteration there. <laughs> um, so my background, before as Nantuck, I was in the School of Communications at Quinnipiac University doing academic advising, and I had spearheaded the development of the first year program there, which was a one credit academic course that everybody who came into the School of Communications took. Um, prior to Quinnipiac, I was at the School of Business in uh, University of Connecticut. And while I was there working on my graduate work, I spent a summer at Cape Cod Community College, and that's where I kind of fell in love with the kind of community college experience um, and the student and everything that they are, are encompassing when they're going through the process. So. Excellent. Excellent. So we talked a little bit about the fact that you're both academic advisors. Why don't we just tell me a little bit about how academic advising works at Is Nantuck? Sure. So, um, you know, we, we do a couple of things. We have walk-in advising for students uh, when class registration is happening. So students will come in and talk to us about uh, their course needs. Uh, but really, I think the bread and butter for our office is uh, appointments that we make with students to really get to the heart of what they're doing in college. Uh, so we sit down and talk to them about what are their academic goals, what are their career goals, and kind of how are we able to meet those needs at Esnantuck. Yeah, just to piggyback a little bit off of what Amanda said, the, the crux of what we do when somebody says, oh, you're an advisor, mm -hmm. right? So you help students pick their classes. And really what we're doing is the whole goal setting piece. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, how many of us have set a goal and six, seven, eight months later, you're going to see what your progress is and you're setting another goal or a different goal? Um, and how do you set those goals, whether they're academic or professional, and then actually achieve them? What are the tiny little steps that you need to take and the resources that you can utilize within higher ed? Um, and that's kind of academic advising in a nutshell. 
That's great. I mean, so it certainly is, sounds like a holistic approach towards meeting the students' needs when you have somebody come in and tell you, here I am starting at point, point A, and I need to get to point Z or whatever. How am I going to get there? And you help them lay that out. Um, what also happens sometimes, like you were saying, it's not just picking out classes. There's a lot more that goes into it. A lot of times people seem to uh, get the uh, process of advising and registration mixed up as well. So, so how does that work? How do they go from the role of advising to registration? And what's in, you, in your minds? What's the difference between those two roles? Yeah, I think when it comes to registration, so every program has a course of study, right? So when you are, you come into as Nantucket and you decide, I want to go communications, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to give you a sheet that says, here are all the courses that you need to finish to do communications. Most folks, if you're familiar with the catalog um, or, or course sequencing, it's pretty intuitive on which courses you need to take, mm -hmm. but what are the prerequisites? And if I'm going to take X course, underwater basket weaving 365 is the <laughs> example I like to use, right? Mm -hmm. What's What are the time requirements in that course? What's the professor going to look for? Mm -hmm. What's the commitment level? And then how does that fit in with my job, my personal responsibilities? Am I taking care of a family member? Do I have children? Mm -hmm. um, am I working 20 hours a week or 40 hours a week, mm -hmm. right? And unless you're kind of immersed in the higher ed culture, it can become difficult to navigate figuring out which courses you need and when do you need them in the daytime or the evening? When are you most productive, right? It all kind of goes back to the whole goal setting mm -hmm. and getting to know yourself, so. Yeah, yeah. And, <coughs> and in terms of tools that you use along the way, you mentioned before degree sheets. Those are things that students can have that's something tangible to mm -hmm. help them refer to semester after semester in terms of what their requirements are. But um, what other sorts of tools, what else do you to use in the process of advising? So, uh, I mean, the degree sheets are definitely helpful for students, uh, but we do have some kind of uh, technology that we've been utilizing. So That's students fun. can go online to DegreeWorks, uh, and DegreeWorks is kind of a, an online degree auditing system, which means that students can uh, take a look at what they have left to take uh, within their program. Uh, we also have Starfish, which mm -hmm. is um, Nice for advising, I think, because it's not just about the coursework, but it's also about how is the student doing in class? Is mm -hmm. the student attending class? Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of a good tool for uh, faculty to contact <coughs> students if they want to uh, talk to them about what's going on in the class, or if they're missing class, or if they have homework issues, uh, but mm -hmm. also to give props to the student. So if the Absolutely. student's doing really well, um, it's a good tool for uh, also kind of boosting their, their self-esteem in the class. Yeah, and I think what we haven't mentioned is that all three of us actually have, have had the experience of teaching a first-year experience class mm, at yeah. the school, and um, that Starfish uh, mm -hmm. product is is definitely a great tool for, like you said, not just talking about the hey, notice how you missed class this week, you know, sending an alert or a flag, um, but it's even better for uh, the props piece and giving them that positive reinforcement to let them know that hey, you know, you're doing great, keep up the good work, mm -hmm. and that'll help them kind of stay motivated as yeah. things go along. I right. think sometimes students really need that motivation piece. Uh, you know, students will come in and maybe be uh, feeling a little bit discouraged. Right. It's their first time in college. They're very nervous about it. So, um, you know, helping them feel comfortable and, and showing them that they're able to be successful is, is a good thing. Excellent. That's great. So, somebody comes to see you. What are the most commonly asked questions in, in the advising office? How quickly can I graduate? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every single time. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. the number one question that we get. You know, mm -hmm. when can I earn my degree by? Um, how many courses are required? When do I need to take them? Mm -hmm. It always comes back to the course sequencing, right? Mm -hmm. Which obviously is very important. You know, I joke with my students that time is like a little toddler in a tiara. It's precious and short, <laughs> right? And I'm here to help you maximize that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, the general conception when you come to a community college is I can earn my associate's degree in two years, right? But mm -hmm. then the question becomes, and do they know that you need to take 15 credits per semester um, to complete that degree. So that's the question I get over and over again. How quickly can I finish? Mm -hmm. That's great. Right. Yeah. <coughs> and it, a good number of our students, I'm going to say somewhere in the semester to semester, somewhere yeah. between 60 to 65% of our students are actually part-time. Yeah. Um, but 
you know, there is a push towards, you know, trying to get students to consider going full time. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there's studies that have shown that even you know attempting at least one full-time semester within your college career mm -hmm. uh, does lead to uh, higher rates of completion. So, um, what are some, I guess, initiatives that that are that are taken on in the advising office with regard to you know trying to help students with that nudge to to work towards completing? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, um, you know, we always talk to students about what they are able to handle in regards to course load, right? So, yeah. if we think they can handle 15 credits, we always say, you know, you can take this fifth class. The fifth mm. class is free, uh, which is a nice thing for students. So, if they're able to, uh, you know, complete the the fifth class, they they get it for a reduced cost. Um, mm. And uh, just making sure that, that, that they're able to do that because from an advising perspective, uh, we're looking at kind of the holistic student, so not just um, you know, the coursework, but like what else is going on in your life? Do you have the ability to do this? Do you have family obligations? Are you working a full-time job? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that we just want to really take into consideration when, when talking about 15 credits. Good, good, yeah. Certainly the time management piece mm -hmm. is, is essential. Um, what are some of the, if, if we haven't touched on them yet, are there any challenges in particular that you see when, when, when advising students? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. time is a mm -hmm. finite resource, mm -hmm. right? There's 168 hours every week that we get, whether you like it or not, and mm -hmm. it's a determination of how do I make everything fit into those 168 hours while still getting sleep, making time to study, mm -hmm. being able to shower, eat, have some type of remnants of a social life, right, and mm -hmm. see your family and friends. Um, so I, for me, the biggest challenge is figuring, is, is helping students navigate if I'm taking 12 credits, right, so four classes, mm -hmm. what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be in the classroom for 12 credits a week, but the conversation that, you know, Amanda and I are having a lot is, well, that means that your professors can expect anywhere from two to three hours of work outside the classroom mm -hmm. per credit, mm -hmm. right? Whereas most students have this preconceived notion that it'll be two to three hours per class. Right. Um, so yeah, yeah and it's I think sometimes it's hard for students when they when you're telling them things that they don't necessarily want to hear like yeah. I have students come into my office and say you know I have two small children at home and yeah. I'm working 50 hours a week mm -hmm. uh, but I am going to take full-time classes and you know sometimes the conversation is well you know you may not have time to do that successfully mm -hmm. uh, and you know figuring out what do you have time to do successfully because every student is different uh, and we always tell students you know it's not a competition right. um, you know finishing is important right mm -hmm. but you need to do it at your own pace and you're more successful when you're able to um, you know have time to do everything exactly good yeah. that's great well so we've talked about the advising piece, and now I'd like to mm -hmm. jump into talking a little bit more about your special areas of responsibility as well. So for starters, Amanda, let's talk about the, the transfer advising process yeah, at the college. Um, you know, tell me, there's this, you know, we're a part of a system, mm -hmm. right, of, of 17 institutions called the Connecticut State Colleges and Universities. Mm -hmm. um, and I've heard there's this thing called the the CSEU tickets, the transfer tickets. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, so the transfer tickets are relatively new and uh, basically what they're designed to do is help students really seamlessly transfer from a community college to one of the state schools. Mm -hmm. So um, state schools that are not UConn, so Central, Southern, Western, Eastern, um, and also Charter Oak. Uh, and what they've done is they've designed programs in different disciplines and mm -hmm. they've made it to where uh, students take kind of that basket of credits that they get from as Nuntuck uh, it should be about 60, 61 credits uh, and transfer that directly into um, the, the last two years of the program at uh, one of the state schools. Um, and yeah, so we're really excited about kind of how all of that is working. That's great. And we have a, a number of programs that have those uh, transfer tickets associated yep, with our absolutely. degree programs, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. It, so many that you can think of. Biology, chemistry, English, political science, computer science, mm -hmm. uh, there, there are many. Many, very degree specific, so it's great. When they mm -hmm. transfer over, they're not, they're not losing any credit. Yeah. And ideally, they're, you know, gonna finish in as close to the, if they're going full-time, two and two type 
format as, possible. as close to possible. Yeah, there are a lot of national statistics that show when students transfer <laughs> from a community college to a four-year institution that they lose their coursework. Mm -hmm. So they're losing two, three, four courses when they transfer because the receiving institution or, or the four-year school is not taking those credits. Mm -hmm. uh, this is really designed to uh, not, to prevent that from happening at, in Connecticut. So it's a systematic approach where a lot of that course evaluation has been done up front, where mm -hmm. you know courses that were put into the degree program actually have already been checked off as though they will count. Right. And so you do some events and such, and I think we have a picture up there of a, of a transfer fair yeah. right now. Um, so it, how do students find out more uh, about programs that they might be interested in at different schools? What are, what are ways that, what's the best way for students to find out about different schools and what's out there? So I would say if they're an Asnantuck student to come talk to me, um, just because so. I kind of have a lot of things going on. Every fall we have a transfer fair uh, that's happening and uh, usually over 30 colleges and universities from uh, the New England area come to talk to our students to give them idea, um, an idea of like the programs that they offer there and if they would be a good fit for those students. Every Tuesday I have a smaller version of that, so it's called Transfer Tuesday. And what happens is uh, usually two to four colleges uh, sit at a table on campus and students are able to come talk to them about kind of their career goals, uh, their academic goals, and to see if, if those colleges would be a good fit. Um, we also have like several other things going on on campus every year. Uh, Kat and I run a joint a nursing information session um, because we don't have a nursing program on our campus but students are able to take prerequisite requirements to get into nursing so um, we bring people to campus so that uh, they can kind of talk further about that. Okay, great. Now when a student's talking to these schools and trying to make that connection and understand the admission requirements, oftentimes I know one thing that they're wondering is not only what, what, what classes will transfer but, mm -hmm. but what major should they be in? So is there any way that you can help them to figure out what major is best suited for them? Sure. So uh, it's funny when, when students really have no idea what they want to major in. I generally send them over to Cat uh, <laughs> and say, "Talk to Cat, um, work with Cat, and, and we can kind of uh, get a jumping-off point of like, what do I want to do with my life?" Um, it's easier when you can kind of narrow it down mm -hmm. uh, because then we can, um, you know figure out a, a school that's a good fit for them. Uh, when students don't know what their major is, mm -hmm. um, it is a little bit harder to figure out what school they want to go to, so mm -hmm. that's kind of the first step in their process. Okay. Um, and once they've figured that out, uh, then they come back to me and we talk about, okay, is this major offered at the schools that you're interested in? Um, you know, what are those schools? Uh, do you have any idea where you might want to go? Because if not, that's the point where we start to really narrow it down. Excellent, good. So maybe that's a good transition to now talk to Kat a little bit about sure. the whole uh, career aspect too. So there is so much that is connected between, like you're saying, trying to find that right major, yeah. you know, what's going to be that right fit for me, and it ties in with the schools. But yeah. so how do, you, how do you go ahead and work with students that come to you first and say, hey, what am I going to do with myself for the rest of my life? Yeah, so it depends kind of what their anxiety level is at that point, yeah. right? Are they feeling really anxious or are they kind of like, okay, I've got some time to figure this out, but I really need to narrow it down, right? Um, so if they're anxious, I always share the story with them that when I was an undergrad at UConn, back in 2003 I started, um, I was going pre-pharmacy, right? I worked in a pharmacy all through high school, I knew it was what I wanted to do, and then the night before classes start, I freaked out. <laughs> I was like, no way, I don't want to take chemistry and bio and pre-calculus and all of these courses, I'm changing my major. Um, and I changed my major, right, so that was the first time, then I changed my major Mm, three more times, so four <laughs> in total before I landed somewhere. Um, and, and I tell them, you know, I jokingly say, I turned out relatively okay, right? Um, so you'll be fine. We're just going to take the time. You're asking the right questions early about what should I do. And then we have two major tools that I use here at Nuntuck. So we've got Focus 2, which is a self-assessment. It looks at um, your skills, your personality, your values, and your interests. Right, so there's four main components that show whether or not you're going to find a career that makes the right fit. Um, the biggest mistake I made when I was an undergrad is I loved sports, so I finally landed in sports management or kinesiology. I didn't look at my personality, my values, or anything else. So I did my internship with an ESPN analyst my senior year, and I hated it. <laughs> with like this passion of a thousand burning suns, it was the worst decision I'd ever made because it just didn't fit my personality, you know? 
So 2007, when I had graduated, I had this beautiful four-year degree in a major that I didn't want to do for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So that's the first tool is we use Focus 2 and we look at those four main components. The other major tool, I use it as Nuntuck, which I've really come to love. It comes out of the University of Tennessee, is called, What Can I Do With This Major? Mm -hmm. Because here's the other student we see. I love English and I want to major in English, but my parents tell me, no, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. You're not majoring in English. What are you going to do with that degree? Mm -hmm. And what, what, I can, what can I do with this major does is it has categorized basically every single major that you could ever do at a college, anthropology, um, physics, English, political science, like you name it, it's on there. And it shows what jobs you can do with that, what industries, what the employers are, what the rates are. I mean, it's just a treasure trove of, of information. So I show them that, and then they've got this tangible takeaway of, well, everyone's always told me that I could never do anything with a history degree, but here's everything you can do with a history degree. That's great. And it gives them the language to have those conversations with their friends and family who are like, what are you doing with the rest of your life? But it also gives them that, right, it all comes back to goal setting, mm -hmm. that tangible end goal of, mm -hmm. okay, I know that I've got something I'm working towards. So. So once a student figures that out. Yeah. And um, they're no longer undecided, they know what major they want to be in, mm -hmm. how can they bridge that gap between college and career, right? So now, how do they kind of tie those things together. Yeah, there's so many things they can do. Um, the two biggest tools I like to talk about are the informational interview and the dream resume, right? So now I know what I want to do with the rest of my life. Great, I tell them. You need to go out and talk with people who are doing what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Get their stories. What did they do in college? What were the part-time jobs they held? What were the electives they took? Um, what type of leadership experience did they have? Because one of the biggest mistakes that I see students make, and I think all of us who work in higher ed see students make, is they're so focused on the degree, mm -hmm. right, and earning that degree, that we forget about all the other stuff that comes with it, all of those experiential activities and the leadership that employers are looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't want to get to the end of whether it's your associate's degree or your bachelor's degree with nothing else on your resume other than here's my degree and a couple part-time jobs that I have, mm -hmm. right? Employers are really looking for the leadership, the teamwork, those soft skills that we're always talking about, those are demonstrated in those experiences outside of the classroom. Um, so when I'm talking about the dream resume that I mentioned earlier is there's this great website called LinkedIn, mm -hmm. right? You can generally go on LinkedIn and find, oh, somebody who majored in underwater basket weaving, mm -hmm. and they have told you everything that they've done that's helped them be successful. Mm -hmm. Become a copycat. That's right. Great. What of those experiences are available where you're at that you can fill in the blanks on what is currently a blank resume? That's excellent. That's excellent. So I know, and I'm thinking about time here, I know that you've both developed basically, uh, well, when you, let's, let's back this up for a second, how do you get word out about the services that you provide to students? So it's coming on changing lives. Yeah, <laughs> changing, changing lives. Yeah. Uh, lots of emails, flyers, yeah. um, getting in contact with the faculty members. Mm -hmm. So, you know, students are in class all the time. So, um, you know, if they're not answering their emails, then maybe they are listening to their instructors. Mm -hmm. uh, so I always send a flyer and an email to all of the instructors about the events that we have. Excellent. And I know. Yeah, I beg to go thing. in classrooms. Yeah. Classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anytime yeah. I can get a captive mm -hmm. audience and, you know, That's I can great. get 20 to 25 five students in front of me even if it's just for five minutes yeah. you know if they know that I exist like that's generally my goal into when I go into a classroom Excellent. I want you to know that I exist and these services are here because you're going to transfer to a four-year school at some point and the career development center is going to be huge mm -hmm. right and if you walk in my office at this point in time I can schedule you a one-hour appointment one hour is a whole lot more than 15 minutes or something that you're going to get when you transfer. Absolutely. So. That's great. And I know one other thing that you do, too, is you've been a part of the orientation process yeah. as well. Yes. And during the orientation programs, you've developed and you show students your top five tips for transferring career, right? Yeah. Yes. So I think we have some slides to go over these, and I don't want to end our show without covering these top five tips if possible. So why don't we start by talking about the top five tips for, for, for transfer. Uh, so, so, yeah, absolutely. So top five tips for transfer and career. Um, you know, and Kat and I uh, developed this when we got to as Nuntuck, and, and these are just kind of the basic things that we would like you to know uh, when you are kind of starting out in the process. So uh, 
top five transfer tips for success. Number five is start early. Uh, so I always talk to students about starting early because it's going to make the process as easy as possible. Uh, if you start early, then we can really get you on the right track for the, the classes that you're taking, uh, making a decision about which college. Uh, this gives students the opportunity to do things like visit campuses uh, and really get an idea of where they might want to go. All right, number, number four. four. <laughs> talk to an advisor. So. Um, I always tell students don't completely self-advise. Sometimes students will come into the office and they have spent the last two years kind of doing their own thing and, and trying to figure it out themselves. Uh, but then they don't really get to take advantage of kind of the whole process of um, getting help, knowing which classes to take. Sometimes uh, I have information that's not kind of out there on the World Wide Web um, mm -hmm. that other schools have, have talked to me about. So it's, it's really important to kind of uh, take the opportunity to talk to an advisor. Uh, number three. Maintain a high GPA. Uh, you know, that seems pretty self explanatory, but it, it's really important to think about what is the GPA that I need to get into the program that I want to go into. Mm -hmm. So, some programs require a very high GPA. If you're going into a business program, especially at a place like UConn, um, they require like 3.3 to 3.6 uh, just to get in the door. Yeah. Um, but just knowing what the GPA is for the program that you need and trying to maintain as high of a GPA as possible. Great. Uh, number two, qualifying for aid. So, 77% of colleges reported that they provide merit scholarships to transfer students. Mm -hmm. uh, there are several things that our students qualify for. Um, we have Phi Theta Kappa students who qualify for a lot of scholarship money when they go to other places. Uh, many places just have regular transfer scholarships uh, for students coming in after two years that have an associate's degree. Um, I tell every student you need to apply uh, for financial aid even if you don't think you're eligible because a mm -hmm. lot of times you need to do that for uh, the scholarship money at okay. least. Uh, and number one, complete the associate's degree. So there's a bunch of research out there that shows students who earn their associate's degree are uh, more likely to then complete their bachelor's degree. So um, for the most part, students should really complete that associate's. Uh, there are potentially um, reasons why that might not be the case, like if you're a nursing student at Nuntuck because we don't have the nursing program, mm -hmm. or if you're going into a really specific field where we don't have all of the coursework, um, but for the rest of students, they should really complete that full associate's degree. Excellent, great. And Kat, into the top five for, for career. Yeah, so the first tip I always give students is utilize your electives, okay. right? The general student wants to save their electives to the end, and I get it, you want to take classes that you're inter you know, you're having fun with. Take them early, use them to take an intro class, intro in business, intro in human services, intro in early childhood education. Um, so utilizing your electives is the first tip. Um, the second one is attend as many events as possible. You never know who you're going to meet. You never know who you're going to learn. There is so much going on on campus. Most students just go to class and go home. Mm -hmm. Stick around for a little bit, see what's happening. Um, number three is go to professor's office hours. They are the most underutilized resource on any college, two or four year school across the country. Mm -hmm. If you are an accounting student and you have an accounting professor, go talk to him or her, mm -hmm. right? See what are good electives to take, what experiences do they have, what can you learn from them? Um, the second tip is to job shadow. Job shadow, job shadow, it's so different actually being in a job somewhere and then just conceptually thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And then the number one tip that I always say is make time. Like I said before, you only have 160 hours in the week. How are you going to use that? There's always going to be an excuse for not doing something. Make mm -hmm. the time, carve it out in your calendar. Excellent. And with that, I want to thank you both for making time to be with me tonight here on this <laughs> show. And that's the end, I think. I think we're, we're, we're at the end. So I just want to thank you again, both Amanda Looney Getz and Kat Carter, for your time being with me. Thank and you. we look forward to seeing you on campus soon.
so close it can take you so far. It's fine.